we're going to really talk about essentially more about the theme of the event, which is really around that idea of integration across domains and disciplines. And really, why do we want to do that? Well, we want to do that because we need to understand the operational environment. The operational environment is a complex environment. It's you know situated and impacted by many factors around it. And then in addition to that, it's dynamic and it changes based on conditions and influences that happen during operations. And it's also becoming increasingly complex. Those interwoven factors are growing. The tensions on the operational environment are increasing. The interrelationship between those factors are growing. And I think that's why we see this new focus on this joint all domain environment, understanding that in fact, all the elements of the domain of the operational environment have impacts on others and their interrelationships really matter. And fundamentally, commanders need a comprehensive and dynamic view of that environment. So when I think about well, how do we solve that problem, how do we help bring sense and knowledge to the our, our view of the operational environment, I come back to my to my training. And really what we have learned is that there is a there's a process we can apply that helps us develop our understanding of the operational environment. And in the military speak, that, that process is called IPV or IPOE, intelligence preparation of the battle space. And what it really is, it's not um, it's not just a term or just a process. It's a scientific and methodical approach to developing our understanding, to take us from not understanding to situational understanding about our environment. And it follows broadly these four steps of defining the operational environment, describing the effects, evaluating the threat, and then determining courses of action. And so we're going from a complex problem to a better understanding. And to take us through that, we're gonna take a demonstration where we actually go through those four steps and during that demonstration, we're gonna show you how a GIS helps create that living view of the operational environment, not a bunch of static products that are out of date the minute they're created, but a living live view of the environment going through all of those steps. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Armando, who's gonna take us through the IPB process. Thanks, Ben. Let's continue exploring the topic of situational awareness of the operational environment and examine the critical role that geospatial awareness plays at every step of the process. Understanding the content and information at your disposal is the first step in defining the environment. Equally important is identifying where content gaps exist. So limited resources can be prioritized correctly to fill them. One way to inventory what data is available is through a configurable application that structures content in an easy to digest format, thereby reducing the time to identify anything relevant to our mission. The first product I want to highlight is the common intelligence picture that I've configured to stream in live significant activity from around the world. We'll leverage this information as a starting point for a fictional exercise taking place in the city of Adelaide on the southern coast of Australia. To also support the exercise, we created another focused application providing key aspects of current weather conditions like precipitation, temperature, and wind speed. Understanding the impacts of weather is a critical component to predicting our enemy disposition. This product allows for the modeling of future environmental changes and the understanding of the probable impact on our operational landscape. One challenge for analysts today is storing and visualizing civil considerations data in a format that's easily consumable for decision makers. Utilizing geocards, we've been able to organize our civil considerations data into the PAMISI A-scope variables to clearly lay out the key information our decision makers need in a structure that they expect. On the top left, we have political areas that coincide with our area of operations. Note that this one is highlighted in green, indicating that it was recently updated. The cards in black indicate where we also have data but it might be a little bit out of date. Finally, the cards in red indicate an information gap in that particular domain and where we may want to prioritize new collection efforts. Digging into political areas, we see that information about regional political boundaries is available. This is critical information because in our exercise, South Australia has become a failed state with an insurgency group originating out of the Port of Adelaide, slowly taking control of the region. As such, it's important to understand what political structures might be strategically valuable to the insurgents, like town halls and other government buildings. 
These vacated buildings could potentially be used by the insurgency group as a base for their operations. This experience allows for the exploration of all available data, even if it's non-spatial in nature, like this organizational chart of the insurgent group currently occupying Adelaide. Switching gears to examine data available on infrastructure, I'd like to assess the operational status of key facilities, such as a power plant. To fully understand the operational environment, I need to answer questions like, have the insurgents taken control of any of the region's power plants? Are those facilities operational? Currently, I can't answer these questions because we haven't collected any data on power plants in the region. Let's close that gap by filling out a request for information directly from our Civil Considerations app. Notice, much of the information is pre-populated based on the Civil Considerations section of the app that I was in and my identity within the platform. I simply need to enter the pertinent requirements that describe the nature of my request, such as the activity levels and locations of power plants in Adelaide, which is noted here in my essential elements of information. Lastly, I can direct the analyst receiving this RFI to the specific location in Adelaide where I need data and then submit. After RFIs are submitted, they can be viewed and managed within a dashboard. Here we have various metrics and indicators that can be used to brief leadership, as well as interactive charts that can be used to filter down RFIs by categories such as their status. After an RFI has been submitted and validated, it needs to be assigned to the appropriate intelligence section for execution. In this case, because the most recent RFI involves determining infrastructure activity, it will be assigned to the image intelligence or Emmet section. Because the data behind the RFI survey is being monitored, we can use that to trigger alerts that notify intelligence sections whenever they get assigned an RFI. In this case, the notification is done via email. And since this RFI was assigned to the Emmet section, the notification included a link to ArcGIS Excalibur. Excalibur is a web-based application that unifies imagery and geospatial data in a single experience. It allows users to discover imagery and conduct streamlined image analytics in any modern web browser. In this case, we will utilize it to extract critical information regarding the power plant in order to fulfill this RFI. Within this project, we have an image service provided by Planet that contains high resolution imagery over the power plant. You'll notice that the images are a little dark and difficult to see, but we can quickly correct that by turning on dynamic range adjustment which optimizes the contrast based on the pixels being viewed. And we can also turn on gamma, which boosts luminosity within the image. Now that our images have been adjusted, let's take a closer look at the power plant. We can view multiple images in this experience simultaneously and quickly flicker between them to identify differences or make observations associated with our RFI. In the first image, we can see the plant appears to be intact, but there are no obvious signatures or indicators of activity. While in the second image, we can see that the plant is indeed active with clear observables such as the runoff and emissions from the chimney. We can now take the more recent image and capture information through an observation feature layer which is integrated with our organization's GIS. While collecting the observation, I can capture important information such as the power plant's operational status, as well as key physical characteristics. This feature is now discoverable throughout the ArcGIS platform. In addition, we can create imagery-derived products for those who may need it. By marking up the map, I can quickly bring attention to the different characteristics of the power plant. And once my markups are complete, I can generate a report. Notice, key metadata associated with the imagery is automatically captured within the report. Now that we've collected an observation and created a report, Let's return to our civil considerations matrix. 
We can see that the observation we collected is immediately accessible in the infrastructure structures web map. We can interact with the feature and see the information that was not only captured by the analyst, but other pertinent information that was automatically captured by Excalibur, such as the image name and the collection date. Let's take a look at how these different data sources come together in defining the operational environment. The operational environment can be very challenging to understand due to the sheer number of data sources contributing to the overall picture. Analysts need to combine information and understand the relationships between people, places, equipment, and the activities being observed over the battle space. This is no small task, but ArcGIS Pro Intelligence has the tools analysts need to carry out their work to perform this complex analysis. We now know there's a major active power plant located on an island near the port. Let's explore other useful information for defining the operational environment. Because a power plant is located on an island, these rivers and bridges are critical to any potential ingress and egress routes insurgents might take. Understanding civil considerations in our area of interest is also important, such as schools, hospitals, and places of worship. Additionally, we have an elevation data set from which we've derived a slope layer and land cover data where we've isolated key classes like urban terrain. These derivative products will be inputs for later analysis. Lastly, let's view our enemy unit locations to understand their disposition relative to our geography. Up to this point, we've searched for and discovered all relevant information available to us over our AOI. This will be leveraged and further refine continuously in the execution of defining the operational environment. Confident that I have enough of an understanding to continue my planning, I'll next create a modified combined obstacle overlay, commonly known as a MACU. To create our MACU, we'll incorporate several things like the slope and land cover layers mentioned earlier to get an understanding of the urban terrain and forested area that will restrict movement. We'll leverage raster functions to complete this workflow, automatically interpreting and analyzing our data on the fly. We created a model with inputs to uniquely process a surface based on the type of movement, whether mounted or dismounted, and accounted for the variations between wheeled or tracked vehicles. The resulting combined obstacle overlay displays unrestricted terrain in green, restricted areas in yellow, and severely restricted terrain in red. And lastly, areas in black indicate built-up locations. Additionally, we can leverage models to understand the military aspects of weather and determine if temperatures are favorable or unfavorable for executing cross-country maneuvers. We can continue to update the enemy order of battle as we receive new information, like this target package of an enemy mortar unit. It contains information on the unit's location in military grid reference system format its military symbol ID code, its parent unit, and the maximum effective firing range of the mortar. Traditionally, we would have to manually dissect this package to pull out locations and key attributes to plot it on the map. But using tools designed for working with unstructured data, we can automate the process by simply connecting to where the package is stored and let the software do the heavy lifting for us. Notice the new enemy feature symbolized here in the Northeast. Let's explore its attributes and hierarchy in relation to the other enemy units in my area of interest. And as soon as we refresh the link chart, the new unit appears properly nested in the enemy's command structure, in this case, under the Charlie company. Now that we've updated the locations and order of battle for the enemy forces, let's examine the key terrain in our area of operations. Key terrain is defined as areas which, if seized, afford an advantage to an attacker or defender. To assist in identifying additional key terrain, it's beneficial to include additional staff members, including those who may not be trained in desktop GIS, like our Intel chiefs. To do this, we've published our maps and data to be consumed in an easy to use web application configured around supporting this specific workflow. Now in a web browser, I have the same combined obstacle overlay, enemy laydown, and previously collected key terrain, including the, this bridge, providing access to the power plant. Since we now know that the power plant is active, I can add that location as a key terrain, given its critical impact to generation and distribution of power to the region. 
In this simple web app, we can perform further analysis to determine if these northern enemy units need to be flagged as high value targets or HVTs. Key indicators that make this assertion are whether they can capture or destroy key terrain, or if they can impact friendly forces operating in the region. Take for example this intersection, controlling this ground would allow you to observe forces from the north or south of this highway and impact movement throughout the area. Notice all the information contained in the target package is accessible in the attributes of this enemy unit, such as the effective range of the mortar, which is 7.1 kilometers. Additional information about equipment can be linked, such as the country of origin and the year built. To assess if this enemy poses a threat to key terrain, we can execute a line of sight or view shed analysis right in our browser to provide us a clear representation of areas visible and not visible to the enemy. Highlighted in green, the intersection can both be seen and fired upon by the enemy mortar, which would compel an intel chief to place this unit on the high value target list. Other critical information inside of our area of operations include these names areas of interest, or NAIs, where activity, or lack thereof, provides an indication of the adversary's course of action we can generate user-driven rules against data depicting enemy activity in the NAIs using a couple different methods. If connected to the network, you can utilize a real-time server, or as I'm showing here, have rules and alerts active and running in your desktop environment. These alerts will appear in the top right corner of your screen, regardless of which application you currently have open. Let's examine the newly reported activities impact on operations where an alert went off in the Northeast NAI. Very quickly, I can assess that alert was triggered by activity from my STANAG 4607 Ground Moving Target Indicator Data, or GMTI. Bringing in additional data sources helps to discern the objects or equipment that prompted that alert. Utilizing full motion video, a truck moving to the north can be spotted, and its location can be captured directly from the video window and drawn on our map. I can also add that image from this frame as an imagery derived product to further solidify the type of movement that's occurring. This confirmed activity is an indicator that a previously assessed potential threat course of action needs to be modified. Let's make these changes to the current running estimate and inform my organization of a new threat course of action, indicating the enemy movement is not headed to the Northwest, but rather to the Northeast. One of the most important aspects to remember about intelligence is that the accuracy, completeness, and speed by which we communicate our analysis is critical to the decision-making process and overall success of operations. Using this site, I can provide relevant and concise information to inform leaders in addition to continuing the efforts across shifts, staff sections, and even organizations. All of the products that we've created throughout our process are housed within this page alongside the data that we've collected. Starting from the top, our common intelligence picture is highlighted to gain situational awareness within our area of interest. The next section contains different data products we've collected in the defined stage that inform our understanding of weather, natural and man-made features, and enemy locations. Also contained here is our civil considerations matrix. Products to describe our environment, like our MACU and key terrain we've identified are all vis easily visualized. We were able to evaluate the enemy's disposition by assessing their order of battle and identifying high value targets throughout our area of operations. Lastly, we applied user-driven rules to monitor threat forces and provided timely alerts on enemy movement, allowing us to update our assessment with the latest information. Our entire workflow benefits from providing actionable intelligence across our organization, which we've delivered at machine speed. Thank you.